Well, Johnny and I are quite jealous of you, Mike. It sounds like you have such a fun job. And we wonder, how did you get started in the science of fun? What drew you to study fun? Yeah, so unfortunately, it's not the best story. Um, I had been studying positive psychology since you know, sort of the that discipline emerged um, right after the millennium. Uh, you know, for folks that don't know what positive psychology is, it's essentially a facet of psychology looking at psychological tools for betterment rather than using, you know, the tools of psychology to create clinical deficits, things like depression and anxiety. And so I had, you know, been swimming in all of that for quite some time uh, from about 2005 to 2016. And in the rearview mirror now can say I sort of optim over optimize my life for happiness um, but in that year, I had some unfortunate things happen. My younger brother unexpectedly passed away. And then also after being a uh, longtime endurance athlete, I uh, lost the use of my hip and needed to get a hip replacement at a fairly young age. And so long story short, I, you know, all these tools have been so successful that I was like, I can will myself out of this despair, right? Like I'll just use positivity and, and make myself happy again. And paradoxically, the more I was trying to do that, you know, sort of bulldog happiness, I was getting close to some of those clinical outcomes. Like paradoxically, I was making myself a lot less happy. And I guess serendipitously around that time, some emerging research was coming out that the professor I like a lot, her name's Dr. Iris Mouse, but her work's been replicated is this Western ideal of happiness. So not necessarily valuing happiness or wanting to be happy, but overly concerned with your own happiness actually makes you ruminate on the fact that you're not happy. And, you know, just like, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, it works in reverse and it can lead to some really interesting consequences. And that's certainly where I was heading. Okay. So that's great, right? Like essentially someone telling me all the tools that you use successfully in the last decade you know, <laughs> are, are now harmful. So if that's the case, you know, I, I, what could I do? And that put me on that quest. And so I fell back on my my research as an academic on this idea of autonomy, right? It's, it's the underpinning this comes from the science of self-determination theory. But what, what we know in work is the, the folks that are the most happy at work are the ones that have a lot of autonomy on how they can do their work. And I was like, okay, why are we talking about these principles in our lives too? Especially since so many of us, you know, through productivity culture and things have been o so over-prescribed. Like what happens if I reclaim you know, some independence, autonomy, and agency over over my time. And that's what I did. I was like, I might be sad because that's an appropriate response to losing a loved one, but I can still go out and enjoy myself. And then sort of this magical thing happened. Once I started doing that, I was like, wait, you know, I have a lot more control over how I feel in the moment than I thought. So it was almost like a way of backing into mindfulness, you know? Yeah. I think for us, and especially the clients we work with, a ton of analytical men in our coaching programs who really struggle to find fun in their lives. And I think Western culture sort of pushes us away from fun as we become adults. So can you just unpack a little bit of your personal journey into fun? Because coming out of loss and certainly that hip situation and, and not being able to run and do the things you love, seems pretty hard to find fun in those moments. Yeah, I think, you know, because you don't need to necessarily identify with an emotional response, right? I think most of us want to displace discomfort. But what we found is that a lot of times we just do that in the most pedestrian way, right? You know, certainly social media use has gotten so villainized, it doesn't need a lot of disposition, right? Like, you know, we know that if we're just sitting there on the couch, it's easy to pick up our smartphone, but that's not necessarily the best use of time, right? It could be relationships, the convenience, you're just kind of doing something because you've habituated that behavior, you know, in a work site, and it could be that stupid meeting that you hate on Tuesday that has absolutely no impact whatsoever, <laughs> yet you still go because you're like, well, it's on my calendar. And so understanding that those things aren't going to necessarily feel comfortable, or again, to answer your question specifically, you know, folks going through divorce or career change or a move where they're having to create new friends, it's okay to have an emotional state that doesn't necessarily fit within that category of happy, but you can still go out and do stuff that's enjoyable, right? And oftentimes that just takes the extra step of going, you know what, I remember I love being out in nature. Like, let me just figure out in this moment 
where that's accessible to me rather than sitting and sort of ruminating on the fact that my life is shitty. I think it, what's interesting is Johnny and I are also in the business of fun and many of our clients don't realize it. So they come to oh, us I feeling social it. anxiety. I you guys for all that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And the first place to start whenever we're talking about building relationships or just shaking the box or breaking out of the monotony that you just talked about, the Tuesday meetings, the social media scrolling, the Netflix binges, the staying inside on the weekends and playing video games, is it starts with putting yourself in a place of fun and enjoyment and then building opportunities for relationships around that. And that's one of the core tenets of what we teach all of our clients. And it's so interesting to see just the change in disposition after a few sessions with us when they're really now almost childlike again, able to tap into their their desires when they were kids, realizing like they shouldn't have put that off in adulthood. It shouldn't have been set aside to chase their career, check boxes, get the house, get the car. And the longer we push it to the side, as you said, the more likely we're going to end up in these clinical situations of depression, anxiety, and feeling like we're completely lost, rudderless, and, and don't have meaning in our lives. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the the thing that is the most challenging is it's insidious, right? It happens over time. So you don't realize it. And so, you know, this could be something that's been brewing, you know, for years and years, and then it catches up with you. One of the biggest insights where I was like, oh my goodness, I'm onto something. And it, it, it was a few le- years later after kind of really playing with this construct of autonomy. It's something in science, and not to geek out on the science, but called the hedonic flexibility principle. And what these researchers found, you know, and these are hardcore researchers, right? MIT, Harvard, and Stanford, is that the folks that are really burnt out, right? So they're grinding it out. And so they're living that, you know, Puritan work ethic. They think, you know, they're giving it all away. And so they kind of, you know, feel good because we've overvalued productivity, they're not showing up as the best versions of themselves, right? So, you know, we call this, you know, in science, passive leisure, and it's already what we've described. Like, that's not fulfilling. That doesn't lead to betterment. That doesn't recharge our batteries. And so you go to the next day and essentially just get on this hamster wheel. But the people that are having fun, you know, how you're coaching people and what you just described and are taking a little bit of time off the table for themselves, all of a sudden you're starting to enjoy life. So you show up the next day and you don't seek out more pleasure. You're actually ready and willing to do the hard stuff because you know life is worth living. It's a blessing and a curse. It's such a subtle nudge, right? I'm sure you guys see it in your work all the time. It's like, eh, I don't, okay, I'll try this. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go from a downward spiral to an upward spiral and it becomes, you know, it takes four to six weeks. It becomes a pretty easy sell after that because they're like, oh shit, I'm doing more and I'm having fun? Like, why, you know, (laughs) why did it take so long? That's certainly a realization that our clients hear in their improv implementation session. So it's one of the most popular attended implementation sessions in our X Factor Accelerator. And it's scary if you've never done improv and you're not really sure of what to say in the moment, but you have to turn off that analytical, logical side that leads to the burnout that we're discussing, that leads to you feeling always on, anxious, thinking about the next deadline, thinking about what's on your calendar. And you really have to put yourself in the moment and go with the conversational flow of the other participants and add yes and is a core principle of improv. And what's interesting is after you know the first 15 minutes of someone's first session, they start to pick up the cadence of what's going on and they start to feel, okay, now I understand the flow. And then they're coming back every single month to that implementation session just because they need that outlet in their life for fun. Because so much of the structure in our life around our career and around the goals that we set for ourselves, we don't leave any room for fun. Absolutely. And I think too, it's just hard to change behavior, right? That was another thing potentially I wasn't as considerate of because I have a slant towards novelty. But for so many of us, if we've done the same thing for so long, that's why people stay in horrible relationships, right? It's like, well, you know, the the discomfort of actually changing my routine becomes, you know, quite the hump to get over. And so it's like, how do you get that taste and then get that taste a couple of times? So you're like, okay, this isn't new. And I don't have the cognitive load of having to kind of make meaning from it. It's just wow, I like this a lot better than what I was doing three weeks ago. (laughs) Well, certainly some people are not going to have the ability to create those those options in their lives. However, 
uh, due to COVID and all of the changing around that we had to, to do in order to be productive, to make things work. We saw that for a lot of people that we actually do have a lot of options. And I, and I think at this point, we would be a good place to go into savor and understand those things that are in the, in your control that, that you can tweak to find where you're going to be the most productive, the most happy, and having the most fun with your work. Where it doesn't have to be the same old thing every day of jumping into the hamster wheel and grinding it out. You're exactly right. I think one of the benefits of the pandemic, if there were any, right, because there certainly were a lot of horrible things to come out of it, but is that we did, we did realize the rhythms of our life were a little bit more malleable than we thought, right? Like, I mean, even if, you know, just thinking about something as simple as, oh, you know, work from home w will never succeed, right? And then all of a sudden the entire globe made it succeed. So I think we realized that we can challenge social norms. So that's more of a, a, a macro thing to think about, but it's, I think most people took away that wisdom, like, wow, I can challenge a lot more about life's rhythms than I, than I initially thought people also became intimately familiar with what worked for them and what didn't, right? And so I, the ability to start to play with the things that you want to do and what you don't want to do and the fact that you can architect your, your schedules a little bit more, you know, that opens up this arena for making big changes, right? You asked about SAVER specifically. It's an acronym for five different tools. The first is story editing. Well, Mike, before we get there, I just, I just also want to point out that depending on our view of how we were going to go through COVID also dictated what we got out of it. So AJ and I were big proponents when everything was going on that no matter what, we were going to come out of it better than we were going in. And we were going to use this time for reflection and to learn about ourselves and our company. And uh, to, to now that everything was going to be just frozen for a time being of what is it that we actually want to do at that point, our company had been going on for quite some time and we were so busy with it that we didn't have an opportunity to change any ideas or to look at the models that we had been running and, and to, to ask ourselves if that's what we wanted to do moving forward. So for us, it was, we're going to use this time to reflect and to grow and to be better coming out of it. But I've also, I watched a lot of people whose idea of dealing with it was, well, I'm going to get a case of beer. I'm going to see what's on Netflix and I'm just going to ride this out on the couch. And I'm like, I don't know if you understand that this is going to be a longer haul than the marathon sprint that you're just going to hang out and watch Netflix for a few weeks and this is going to be over. And of course, that mindset dictated everyone's experience through that. And yes, it, it was incredibly horrible. I, I hope that we never have to have to go through that uh, again. But the, the enlightenment that AJ and I had gotten out of it and a lot of people that we've interviewed who, who, whose books we had uh, interviewed, these authors who had that time to write. And, and you mentioned in, in this book that, yes, you are writing about fun and not such a very fun time. Yeah, I think... You know, I try to show a little grace there. I certainly saw the same phenomena. And I think it's, you know, your predisposition to fight or flight. So, you know, the person that you described that went inward and was like, I, you know, I just need to feel psychological safety. And even if that's maladaptive in the form of, you know, unhealthy escapism, drinking beer and watching Netflix, you know, that was such a crisis. I'm not going to criticize someone at least episodically taking that no, route. No. Um, now you do that for two years. Because you certainly saw it on the other way, right? Like I, you saw people that had such a predisposition to fight that they were, you know, working till three in the morning for companies that were essentially closed because that was their predisposition. And I show them grace too, sure. right? Like, Obviously, that's not a, lo a long-term solution, but that was the response because when they're in crisis, they fight, right? So um, I think you're spot on. I think, you know, the folks that are able to coach others, and it sounds like you guys did a good job, is like this is fertile ground because there's a lot of space to recreate what is important to you and also be mindful in the rearview mirror. Like, 
wow, I'm so glad I'm not doing that right now. And when the lights get turned back on, I don't want to be doing that again either. And so people that did become mindful of their time, and luckily I think it was a significant proportion of people, um, are now able to make better choices, right? It's certainly not everyone because you're seeing a lot of folks just glad that it's over and going back into the old grooves of their life, which, you know, to some degree is unfortunate, but it's comfortable, sure. right? And so, no, you're, you're spot on. Um, and I think, you know, I applaud people that did take that opportunity. And I think there are a lot of folks like yourselves that were like, let me come out of this better because as much as it is horrible, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to do so. Absolutely. so yeah, just quickly to go through Saver. Um, so the S stands for story editing and it's essentially, you know, what we just described, like looking at the science, you know, things like the hedonic flexibility principle and realizing that the fact that you're not having fun at all, it likely means that you're less productive. And so changing that kind of Puritan social norm, you know, that you have to grind it out till the end of the day is, is maladaptive and likely why you're, you know, if you're feeling burnt out, it's, it's a good, you know, place to start. Well, one point there, Mike, with, with hedonic flexibility, that's, we have a lot of words going on there. And I want to make sure that our audience understands that because they have been taught that, uh, hedonism is is bad, right? And to stay away from the hedonic treadmill. So I want to explain what that hedonic flexibility, was it meter? Uh, what that was. Yeah. So thanks for that. Because hedonic tone simply means in psychology, something that we enjoy doing, right? In fact, it's got such a bad connotation that we now call it valence. I was just on my mentor's podcast, Michael Gervais, and he, he kind of took me to task on this because, yeah, I'm... I get, I get that, that for some people, it's not triggering per se, right? But they're like, wait, I was told not to chase pleasure all the right. time. That's certainly, yeah, that's right. That's not what I'm prescribing. I certainly think that there are um, some ill effects of that. But um, so hedonic tone and the reason we use, uh, you know, hedonic is, is simply, you know, a way to say that we're enjoying things. And so, again, to, you know, circle back to, to the science of this, what we know, and this comes from a large study of 20, 28,000 people. So this isn't like, you know, a lot of times big idea authors will, you know, cite a study that has 30 participants. Like, okay, you, you might be over applying this, right? But I mean, this is a, a rich data set. And it suggests that when we are burnt out, yes, we, we look for untethered escapism that could potentially be harmful, exactly what we've been talking about on the podcast. But people that are enjoying life, so the clients that you talked about, the folks that are finding ways to take a little bit of time off the table to recharge their batteries, to understand that life is worth living, they show up and have the capacity, the, the vigor and vitality to do the harder stuff and want to do that stuff. You know, start because their quote unquote fun cup is full, they start to look for betterment. They want to accept new challenges because they have the energy to do so. And so, how we've gotten so far off track in the U.S., I don't know. But it's clear that slowly but surely we're coming to that understanding. You're seeing countries in the EU get wise to this. I mean, we're already second to last with regards to just something as simple as getting leisure for employees, right? I meant 10 days per year's worth of work puts us at the very bottom with the exception of Micronesia that has nine days off, right? But what's even more fascinating is even though we're second to last, only 50% of folks are using their PTO. So we're not even engaging in leisure, let alone fun, right? And so you're seeing countries in the EU literally shutting down email servers on Friday. So you're creating that social norm not to send work emails on the weekend because that should be preserved for family, friends, and actually enjoying yourself because then you can really do legitimate productivity starting Monday, right? Why we're not there, I don't get it. But Again, the science is clear, and the, and the reason story editing becomes important is so that, you know, exactly what you guys are teaching, like when you do this, you're actually going to be a much better entrepreneur, a much better, you know, father and friend to the, to the folks that you care about, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's just weird. It, we're, we're so in need of a corrective. I often like to look at it as, remember in the 90s when all of us would wear sleep deprivation as a badge of honor? Oh, yeah. Like literally yeah. we would celebrate like bro, I only got 20 hours of sleep this week. Like I'm crushing it. And then after, you know, two decades of rich literature to suggest that it's the most asinine statement ever and all of those folks fell on their face, you're even seeing the Gary Vaynerchuk's of the world who I respect, 
but you know he's completely walked that back right he even has a a, a cheap happiness officer in gary media because he knows like he was steering people wrong you know i think still on my blog because i didn't want to you know live a curated life i still have a post where i was celebrating where he's like you want to you know you you want to crush it stop watching lost and make sure that you work after you put your kids to bed like you know, that's how silly we were and now we're seeing the same things with leisure right like oh man i you know i'm answering emails till my head hits the pillow like uh, okay well is that busy or is that productive right well another point to this that i think is really important is understanding that there are these work cultures that are forcing us into these boxes too. So even though work will say, hey, you have you know two weeks of vacation time, if everyone at work is not taking the two weeks and you're the only one taking the two weeks, it's very hard for you to put up these boundaries to create the opportunity for fun that we're talking about here. And Johnny and I are very fortunate running our own company, fortunate in the viewpoint that we took in to COVID. I know a lot of people feel like their backs are up against the wall and especially with all the layoffs going on, the downsizing in tech, that, hey, you know, the more time I carve out for leisure, the more likely I am to be let go, and then I won't be able to make ends meet. So it is a challenge, and it's culturally something that is slowly shifting, but a lot of companies are starting to go the Twitter route and saying, get back in the office, we need you working harder than ever, and there's no way we're giving you Fridays remote. There's no way we're giving you Saturdays off and turning off the email servers. Yeah, but I would look at tech as an outlier. So let me back up before I, I continue down that path. And I do understand, you know, just like anything that's kind of life hacky, that there's a certain degree of privilege. If you're way down, you know, on Maslow's triangle and you need to work to feed your your family then fun shouldn't be on the top of your priority list. And I try to make a, a you know pretty good stance on that in the book. What I am suggesting is people that do want to be the best versions of themselves, even if they are guided by a sense of duty. So whether that's you know taking care of their kids and their aging parents, or they're an entrepreneur, or they really like the company that they work for and they want to serve them well, by not taking any time off the table, they ultimately aren't able to do the work that they do want. And that's been, you know, proven again and again. Sometimes I'll use this simple math equation of someone that's working 60 hours a week and we're looking at units of productivity as like one unit, right? So they, they work 60 hours to get 60 units of productivity, where again, and this isn't just, you know, conjecture, this is backed by science, someone that's able to kind of shut off and have that transition ritual from work could produce two units of productivity in a 40-hour week. So here's this person grinding themselves to a nub, not enjoying life, probably on route to a, you know, some sort of, you know, clinical condition and only producing paradoxically 60 units of work. The person that's working 40 hours a week that's producing two units of work because they're recharging their batteries and also enjoying life, right? Like is doing way better. And so it's just that subtle shift. And it's really weird. You bring that up of these, this social norm. One, I wouldn't use Elon as the best example because it's clear people are just, you know, it's they're not necessarily even getting laid off. A lot of people are leaving that environment so toxic that, you know, we'll see if it has any sort of longevity. You know, I would use 37 Signals as a better example of, you know, a company that really protects um, their employees' well-being. Um, but, you know, like in life, you can have all the confirmation bias. That you, I'm sure we could go example for example, right? But what I would suggest is that, it's really weird you see any other country, even countries in the Americas, where employees have empathy for each other. Like, I'm going to protect you when you go off on your family vacation. Don't worry, I got your back. And then when you come back, I know you got mine. But here in the U.S., we're like, I can't shut off my smartphone while I'm in Tulum because I might let down my employee because they need me to punch you know, one row of numbers in a spreadsheet. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Well, my wife took a sabbatical and I joined her, worked a little bit o over it while she was on sabbatical in Europe. And it was so funny, everywhere we went, the people that were on their computers working or on their smartphones at dinner or at the beach clubs were Americans. <laughs> we're checking their Slack. We're on vacation. We're trying to unplug and, and couldn't do it. And it was funny watching the Europeans sort of shake their head in disbelief as, you know, why is this person taking the work call in this nice restaurant? Why are they doing a Zoom call at the beach? But it is a very American view that we can't unplug. And if we do unplug, 
someone is going to take that spot from us. Someone is going to move ahead of us. And the work here is much more competitive than it is collaborative and community focused when you look at culturally speaking France. The flip side is, well, the opportunities here for us to get ahead financially are a lot easier than a European system. So there is this dichotomy that I think many of us struggle with. And I, I was really appreciative in the book that you talked about taking a sabbatical and understanding that it is okay to take time for yourself. Maybe it's between jobs. Maybe your work gives you that opportunity and using it as a place to tap into that fun and build that fun habit for yourself. So you do come back recharged. And, and I've seen my wife now come back to work supercharged. Like she's excited. She's very productive and leaning in in work and feeling great about the work that she's doing because she created that space. Whereas before we went on sabbatical, she was burned out. There were some health issues. There was frustrations, stress and anxiety were at an all time high. And even leading up to us leaving, lots of worries about well, what's going to happen when I get back? Are, are, are I going to be able to find a job? Are people going to want to work with me? What am I going to say in this gap on my resume? Uh, which are very real concerns. And they should be. But I think, you know, I, I make a case using other people's data that. I wouldn't necessarily say they're unfounded because they're risks that you do need to take in consideration. But most people that have done it mindfully come back not regretting it with very few consequences, right? And I certainly think now in modern work where for the most part, we're self-reliant with regards to our own retirement, some of those financial risks that would have gated our parents from doing this just aren't there anymore. You know, as long as you're confident that you can find another job, you just pick up your 401k again. And so again, let me preface that comes from a place of privilege, but I am talking about, you know, this middle class where we're essentially now giving a lot away, right? And so I generally don't get this political um, because I, I, I'm not as wise to make these arguments. I've read Dr. Pfeiffer's book, you know, We're Dying for a Paycheck out of Stanford. He makes a much better case than, than I could, but it's clear that we've overprescribed on the Simon Sinek you know, TED Talks of know your why, right? And we're not asking what are we giving away? You know, we're working, working, working. Most of us have enough in the middle class to have a lifestyle that would be meaningful if we didn't move the goalpost. And I talk about that, you know, in the book as well. And yet, you know, this carrot is dangled in front of our face to just work harder and harder. And we don't understand what we're giving up. Social media creates the one-two punch because comparison has never been higher. You know, in the past, you grew up in a neighborhood, you had a job, and everyone made about the same. The CEO of the company didn't make 5,000 times more than the person punching in nine to five. And what happened was you really only saw your neighbors and what they had, and you were really only comparing yourself around the neighborhood. But now you pick up a device and you can compare yourself with any socioeconomic class anywhere in the world at any given moment. And there's this persistent feeling that we hear from all of our clients that they're falling behind, that leisure time puts them further behind, that they're not going to reach their goals. And it's, it's feeling harder and harder to get up the ladder in the corporate world, to get up the ladder financially, to live in their mind, what is the American dream? What is the, the middle class that their parents were able to achieve? Buying the house, having multiple kids, driving the cars that they want to drive and going on the trips. And all of that has started to feel less and less attainable. And certainly if we're choosing leisure over work and we hear it time and time again, and then all of a sudden our clients see a little bit of a shift of, well, wait a second, can I, as we're talking about here, can I bring fun into my work? Can I bring fun into the weekend? Do I have to carve out all of my life for work or are there opportunities for me to story edit, to look at the story that I'm telling myself around work? And look at the story that I'm narrative that I'm building for myself of what success is. That success is X number of dollars in the bank account. Success is this set of car keys hanging on the wall. Success is living in that loft apartment downtown. Maybe success for me is having more time to enjoy playing guitar, having more time to ski during winter. And, and we've had clients coming through the program go, you know what? I'm going to just ski for three months. I'm unplugging from work. I'm telling work, I'm taking a sabbatical, and if they don't want me back, well, I'll find a job when I get back from Utah. I'll see you guys in three months. And they come back wide-eyed, grinning, so full of life, ready to start their own company, start a new business, go back to their original company. So the story editing piece 
this is a story that's pervasive culturally that we have to break free from. And we have to realize we have the control to rewrite our own story for ourselves. what that meaningful happiness is in our own lives. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And then you couple with that, you know, with regards to kind of looking at the history of this for the first time, you know, at least in our lifetime, right? We have these devices that essentially create this curiosity of things that aren't necessarily important to us, right? We know, you know, if our kids are kind of vying for our time, we know what's next. But if that Slack ping happens or that, you know, email, like, um, you know, what, what's behind door two? Door number two is never important, right? right. Like one out of a hundred times, it's going to be important. And if it is important and you don't get to it, you're going to get a text anyways, right? But yet, once we hear that, I mean, uh, my buddy Nir Eyal has a good sort of way of testing this. Like, just put your phone there and then feel the visceral response when you see that little LED light ping up that there might be something there waiting for you. You can feel it. Right. And so one of the like first things that I suggest is creating a transition ritual. It's OK to be off of work for certain hours of your day. And then you decide what you want to do with that. You know, I talk about it in the book about fun at work. Some people even find it fun to be at their desk and work through work as long as that's their decision, you know, because, again, it's flexing your autonomy. Right. So it doesn't if productivity is a value of yours, then great. Like. Uh, Noah Kagan from At Sumo challenged me on this a bit. He's like, in my 20s, grinding it out with my friends because we were drinking beers and we were doing fun stuff along with these, you know, codathons was fun. And so I backed up a little bit. You know, I'm not going to argue that that in that time period when he right. had that vitality and that's really what he enjoyed wasn't a poor use of time. You know, these were all over LinkedIn over the, la the last four weeks. Like since the last time this survey was done, the, the social uh, wellness survey, I think it was just a few years ago, 39% of Americans classified themselves as very happy. We're now down to 19%. The APA, so the American Psychological Association, just did a sur survey about personal well-being, found that war one in four workers are so burnt out, they don't even know what to do when they get home. They have like nothing left in the tank. And so, I mean, we have the data right in front of our face that we're you know, at this immense crisis. And again, I hope we're kind of opening our eyes to fun and leisure in the same way we did with sleep, you know, two decades ago. And with that point and what Noah was making, relationships are also being sacrificed. We talked about, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but our relationship with our coworkers is as fraught as it's ever been. We don't feel connected to our coworkers. We're not spending time at the water cooler getting to know each other. We're not investing at all in their lives. We're so self focused and self motivated to reach our own goals that, heck yeah, Johnny and I have done hackathons at, at AOC. We worked all hours of the night, but we were doing it with a bunch of friends. Like when we started AOC, it was a bunch of friends coming together saying, hey, let's build this thing. That relationship created the space for fun, even though we were doing work. <laughs> but if you view your coworkers as adversarial or competitors that are vying for getting ahead of you or taking advantage of you or one-upping you, which a lot of our clients come to us with, how do I deal with these relationships with our coworkers? then it becomes something that is not fun. All fun is stripped away from work and it becomes a monotonous task that you just got to grind to get ahead. And that's why I think it's, it's so interesting as we start to move into A, as we go through Saver, that there are things under our control. It may feel right now, if you're listening to this, that everything we're talking about up until this point hasn't related to you or maybe you're in a different position, but there are still things that you can find that are within your control Mm -hmm. that you can start to change, turn the dial on to create the space for the fun that all the science you shared earlier backs up, creates the productivity, creates reaching your goals, creates those moments of happiness and joy in our life that power us forward towards the meaningful life that we're all searching for on this planet. Yeah, so I'll get into the other four. So activity bundling is a really accessible tool. Um, you know, some of it's been made uh, popular by James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, but it's essentially looking at the things that we do in our life and trying to figure out ways to add, you know, pleasurable components. And generally, that's all it takes, right? That nudge to be like, wait, I can do that, you know? And so it could be something that's kind of a routine task where you add elements, you know, either bringing friends in, like the, the three constructs that you can really play with 
or the environment that you're doing it, the friends you're doing it with, or the way that you're doing it, right? Changing up the activity itself. And if with just a little bit of creativity, you know, you can often get there, right? An example that I bring up in the book is that I hated physical rehab, you know, with regards to that hip replacement that I got. And so I was, I don't know, you know, for the listeners that have gone through that, it's such a routine thing, you know, especially if you're used to exercise, they put two pound ankle weights, you know, on you just do, you know, one hour of the same movement. And so it was like washing paint dry. And I had a young daughter and, um, essentially to make a long story short, realize I didn't need to be in there. You know, I'm from the fitness space. I have access to folks that are uh, personal trainers that, you know, are able to create uh, medically appropriate moves. So I found a dance instructor that could help me rehab, but then also, you know, brought in my daughter and we had these amazing dance classes for one hour a week instead of sitting in, you know, four white walls and, and, you know, staring at metal equipment. And so it's just those little things like, what are the things that I hate doing and are there ways to do them differently? And that are going to be as unique as the individuals listening, but they're always, you know, the stories are the best, the more creative you can get, you know, to just change these things that are not that fun at all. And the, you know, these ways of creating, I mean, those memories I created with my daughter, we still look back at them and we relive them when we reminisce in them, right? Variable hedonics is just the science that suggests we should add elements of variability to our lives, right? The more that we can index opportunities for fun by being a bit deliberate about it, you know, we invite in more spontaneity. It's just a numbers game, really, right? And so the reason that becomes important to geek out on the neuroscience a little bit is when we know our, when our lives become too routine, we stop encoding information. And so you can essentially look at our brains like a hard drive, right? And so if you had 300 of the same files, would your computer keep all 300 or would it essentially, you know, do that shortcuts all over the place and keep the one file? Our brain does the same. And why that becomes problematic if we're not adding variety to our lives is that when we look back in the rearview mirror after 10 years of doing the same thing, that's all we kind of remember. Like, oh, yeah, I did that thing. You know, the example I I, I use is, do you remember the way you drove to work or do you remember the 300 times you drove to work, right? And that's true for almost anything we habituate. And this is why we get that feeling of living life an autopilot. It's just, it becomes Groundhog Day. And and we we have to be able to extract more enjoyment out of life and fulfillment. We're going to have to shake the box. And this is... For a lot of our clients, they come in, they are burned out, they are tired of it, and they are they are looking to shake the box. And so for us, it's here's all these great tools that you are going to shake the box with in creating and building all this uh, enjoyment and fulfillment in your life. And we're going to s- start by exactly what we uh, had been discussing earlier about what Todd uh, cashed in is what are the curiosities? What are the things that you've always wanted to do, right? Why aren't we doing those things? I remember there was a young lady named Melissa in our X Factor Accelerator program. She always wanted to go surfing, but she never felt that she could leave her office in Colorado to go do that. And as I think it was about a month into the program where she, she was able to de-shackle herself from all of these things. And it's all mind tricks that she had to go through and unchain, unchain, unchain. And when all of those things in her mind were completely unchained, she's like, oh my God, I have time now. And she couldn't wait to go surfing. And, and, and it was in that moment that she realized that she could, that she came on uh, to each of our sessions with just wide-eyed big smile because she did not think she was she was able to do what she thought was impossible and and all of that was working upstairs to to decouple all all of these things and sometimes our friends and our relationships are reinforcing that yep and that's another difficult realization many of our clients will say well my friends don't want to try something new or do something fun like they, they're happy with going to the same bar, drinking the same drink, talking to the same bartender. That's what they enjoy. That's what they want to do. And I feel constrained by that, but I don't know how to make new friends. So they'll join X Factor Accelerator. Or we'll ask exactly that. Well, what have you been putting off? What have you been too afraid to do? 
And are there ways to take that thing you're curious about, add the variability of going and doing it, and bring in a social component with it, whether it's a meetup group, whether it's a ski lesson, whether it's a surf camp. Are there ways in your life that create an opportunity for variability, create an opportunity for building new relationships that can encourage more variability in your life? And that's the the beauty of it. Because sometimes we're reinforced by friends and family that, well, no, we're just going to do the same Friday thing we always do. Go to B-dubs. The game's going to be on. <laughs> Why do you want to go bowling this weekend? Why are you trying to get up on the mountain this weekend? You know we have the same stools at our local pub every single weekend. And that can be very frustrating if you feel confined at work, if you feel there are no fun outlets in your life. Well, and to your point, that behavior that's been habituated, I was really surprised because I don't have it in my life. I think not to pat myself on my back, but I, I, I just really like my friends, right? I've been fortunate enough to have some really cool friends, but I, I was blown away by the amount of people that keep friendships of convenience. You know, oh, it's like, yeah, yeah absolutely. So describing just what you said. Like, so you're telling me you hang out every Friday with people that you don't like, you know? And then, so I'll mention something as simple as why don't you just, you know, especially this, you know, when I was in San Francisco, why don't you check out meetup.com? They literally have something for every affinity group known to man. And even if you're an introvert, you don't have, these people aren't there to make friends. They're ta- they're there to talk about a shared interest. So, you know, it's a plug and play situation. If you don't feel like talking, just, you know, immerse yourself in the content. And like just that light bulb, the way, you know, the same way that it sounds like you guys coach clients. I meant, wait, I can do that. Yeah. That, you know, you're invited to do that. Just ghost that. And to your point, it might be difficult. They might even call you like, hey, why aren't you showing up anymore? You're an adult now. You don't need to answer. You know, you're not going to show up in high school and have a tough, you know, you know, <laughs> unless it's family, then it gets a little bit more complex. For a lot of us, it's not saying cut this person out of your life. They're toxic. Exactly. They're not seeking variability. But it's, it's raising your own level of self-awareness that we're now talking about, that if you remove fun from your life, you become less productive, your goals become more difficult, the monotony, the autopilot continues to play out in your life until you're like some of our clients in their 50s and 60s who are like, man, I wish I would have found you guys in my 20s. Like I let this go on way too long. This tape played, this song played way too many times. And now I'm really stuck. And I feel like I've let time escape me. And we'll talk a little bit as we finish up with Saver, just how we view time versus money and how we need to flip that to, to bring back fun. But In those moments where you say, take one Friday off a month and just allow yourself to go to the bowling league, check out the axe throwing competition, go check out the concert that you've always wanted to go to and just bounce your head to the music, even if you don't know anyone there, or check out the meetup group or go to the mountains. That one Friday of you breaking out of the monotony could be enough to to find that fun, to flip the script for you, to come in Monday more enthused, to join the next Friday with some stories that your friends aren't going to have because they were sitting at the same stool that they've been sitting at for the last 17 months in a row, and realize that you, again, are taking control of your situation versus letting the victimhood set in and saying, well, I don't know anyone. And it's really scary to go out and make new friends as adults. We're not downplaying that. We understand that. But with some simple strategies and some tips working with us in X Factor, you'll realize that there are more opportunities for socialization than ever. You're just kind of blinded to them right now because you haven't taken those glasses off. So that's a good segue into O, which again is a you know fairly accessible tool. And you guys probably know it well. I essentially appropriated it from the Grow model, right? But <laughs> yeah. So O stands for options. And what we know is that when we have more, you know, better options, we make better choices, especially when they're premeditated. So all of what we've just discussed is, you know, put it out on the table and see what, what are the things that you feel are missing. You know, they can be joys from when you were younger, you know, some of those you're going to grow out of, right. But some of them you're not, you know, I find both dancing and playing music being a common one. Like, you know, I do want this back in my life. I just forgotten how to do it essentially. And so you need to be nudged back into that. So, you know, really exploring what are the things that you want integrated into your life once you, you know, create the space to do so becomes an important step. And then the last letter in Saver is R. And I think, you know, we've 
gotten so into introspection and rumination and trying to unpack things instead of born, being action oriented and forward thinking, reminiscing as you know this idea of really sitting and savoring with the things that we really do enjoy, so that we sort of attract them more. So not necessarily the law of attraction or anything metaphysical, but it's clear that when we spend time thinking about the things that really do light us up, one, we expand the fun that we do have because we go right back into that moment, right? So it's a great way when we do have these like small moments in line, instead of, you know, picking our phone out and looking at someone else's curated life, we can remember like, wow, you know, I really enjoyed that. And oftentimes when we do engage in the act of reminiscing, it's a good segue into going, you know what, I haven't talked to Johnny, I haven't talked to AJ for a long time. Like, let me reach out because, you know, we need to do something again. This was a, a great time. Instead of letting Facebook do it for you, you know, where you get the random, you know, yearly yeah. reminder of memory. the fact that your cousin died and you're like, what, this is <laughs> like the memory I want to remember. So doing it for yourself becomes an interesting feedback loop, one that we often don't do because, you know, we've kind of been trained to unpack all of these horrible things and unpacking trauma episodically I'm not suggesting you stop doing that because it is effective, but sitting with malaise and discomfort and trauma is clearly not a path to betterment. And so flipping the script and using those opportunities to be like, you know what, life can be fun and I have a lot more control over it than I thought um, becomes, you know, an effective strategy for making sure your fun habit is a continued upward spiral, as it were. Well, I'm not always good at reading Johnny's chicken scratch, but he has one <laughs> quote that's always on his whiteboard that you can't think your way into acting, but you can act your way into thinking. And so much of what we're talking about here is just taking that bit of action, just taking that, that opportunity in your life to actually seek the fun allows you the opportunity to think about the fun, to reminisce on other memories, to reach out to other people, and opens up all of these pathways that we shut ourselves off from by staying in our logical, analytical mind, ruminating over what could have been, what we'd like to, what we wish we were doing, what we hope we can do in the future, when I just get this promotion, when I just buy this house, when I just get this car, then I'll go on the trip, then I'll learn the guitar, then I'll join the club, then I'll join the bowling league. You're exactly right. And the thing is, time passes us by. You kind of gave a head nod. And what's clear, again, that sort of backs this up, because there's a whole host of, of, of research that we could dig into. But the, the one that you alluded to that's also important is more and more research is backing up the fact that we've overprescribed on financial affluence and that folks that deprioritize needing to make that next dollar and understand that the only thing that most of us can't well, that none of us can make more of, right? Again, I suggest that most of us and probably most of your listeners could make more money mm -hmm. if they wanted to. And so it's an important thing to understand, right? Mm -hmm. If you really want to go drive Uber, you could line your bank account with more money. The one thing that none of us are going to get more of is time. And so when you have a rich understanding of that, you tend to use your time better, especially you know if you aren't an entrepreneur, if you are someone you know, essentially making somebody else rich, you realize, okay, well, I'm an honest person. I want an honest value exchange. I'm going to work hard for a good paycheck. But at the end of the day, I also want to use some of this time. That's something that I only have a finite amount of to actually enjoy life because life is a gift, right? Whether you're spiritual or not, I think, you know, even secular people like we're here, you know, and we're here for a limited time. And so we shouldn't give it all away. We've been fortunate enough to work with some clients in the 0.1% and 0.00% billionaires. And the one thing that they orient their entire life around is not checking their bank account, is time. Whether it's flying private, whether it's figuring out the shortcut, whether it's getting coaching so they don't have to waste time making mistakes. The most wealth and affluent people are actually the most conscious of time. And it's us in the lower class and the middle class who fall into that fallacy that if we just get more money, we will someday unlock more time. And it, it actually doesn't work that way. You're spending every single minute, instead of spending dollars to gain back the time, you're not going to get those minutes back that you spent slaving away for someone else. And I think I would add to what you said, because I obviously you know, cohorted with the same people to get the information for the book. 
is not only that, because I wholeheartedly agree that it's clear in their mind that that's the case, but they're also deliberate about how they schedule their time. They realize that time will always expand and you'll always have the things to do with in regards to that 168 hours a week. And so knowing that they need to prioritize leisure as much as work, they'll put it on their calendar because they know if they don't, then it's like, oh, my calendar's open. You know, I can just grind this out because there's always something to do, right? In, in the modern age of knowledge work, our to-do lists will always fill up all our time if we let it. And so we need to keep those bumper rails, right? We need to figure out what those transition rituals are. And leverage your time accordingly. Like you can leverage your time in your social life by hosting a party instead of going one-on-one for a drink here, a dinner there, a lunch here. You can host a whole bunch of people at one time, leverage that time, that free time that you have, create the fun and opportunity for other people in your network to meet each other, And come out knowing, hey, this is a good person for me to date. Hey, this guy, actually, I I didn't realize how much we had in common. I should definitely spend more time with him. And oh, man, I hadn't seen these guys in a while. I'm going to invite them to my party, give them a reason to come join my life, and reconnect with old connections that had gone astray. So time leveraging, you can use to be more productive. You can use to be more social and create relationship opportunities in your life. Wanted to bring up, we last week we talked to uh, Robert Waldinger, and you referenced the the study in the book. One of the things that he brings up is as we get older, the illusion of time starts to speed up. So maybe you might be at 31, 32 years old, and you're thinking, okay, I really got to do something here. I'm make, I'm running the same day every day. I'm, I'm in this autopilot. I really got to shake things up. But I got all the time in the world here to put a few things together to make that next dollar, to make get that promotion. So I can do these things that I've been thinking about. Well, that illusion is where you get transfixed on that goal. And then next thing you know, you're, you're at 40 and you're like, oh, crud, or 45 or 50. And when those folks get in touch with us, they're in a panic because they already realize that this came up 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and they had the opportunity at that moment to change that trajectory, and they didn't. So now, once it, they're cognizant of it, they're, they're now conscious, and that they see that illusion for what it is, they're now in panic mode, and it doesn't have to be that way. No, Absolutely. <laughs> I think, you know, it just does become important. One of the last things I talk about in the book, you know, and it it can happen at any, I'm at 50 and I still plan to make the best use of the 30 years I have left, right? And so, you know, creating some sort of momentum mori, there's a ton of amazing ones online. I have one in the book, but anything that's just a reminder, right? I think, you know, one you see really effectively used by parents when they have 18 summers with your kids, Right. And so if your kid's 12, like, holy shit, I only have, you know, six summers left. That tends to be just that awareness tends to be a way to go. I'm going to make the best use of these six years I have, you know, six summers I have left with my kid doing that with your own life. You know, assuming we're all going to live to 80 or plus, you know, figure out a backwards counter and just make a note to check in with it once a month. And you're like, holy cow, this is what, you know, it's sort of like watching, you know, again, we're talking about uh, wealth affluence versus time affluence, watching that bank account just tweet or down makes you realize like, I better make the best use of this time. And certainly I use it all the time to check in with my best friends, um, to make sure I'm checking in with my parents, you know, and also to just make sure that, If I've worked too hard, like wondering what I'm giving up for that, like, was this everything that I gave up with regards to friendships and things of that nature, was it worth it? And does this, you know, do I need to sort of re-steer the ship? You guys use the metaphor as a a rudder, and I think that's important. Absolutely. And for many of us listening right now, we tie a lot of our fun to the relationships in our life, to our friends to our family members. That's where the fun is. So I'd love to just touch on the role of relationships in creating and emboldening this fun habit for us. And if right now you might not be feeling like you have those relationships, we can talk about some things you can do to start creating those fun relationships in your life because they're so powerful and impactful. And and as Robert Waldinger talked about in the Harvard Happiness Study, 
those relationships are the essence of our well-being and our meaningful life. Those relationships, as much as the travel alone, the do, the grinding it out at work, the bank account checking, the achieving all of the external things might feel good in the moment. The long term, when you look back over the length of your life, it is the time spent with people you care about that makes all the difference in that meaningful life for us. Yeah, as you guys mentioned, I give a nod to Robert's work in the book. And it's clear that even if you're an introvert, that feeling of connection, and it doesn't even necessarily need to be friends, although it's clear friendship is extremely important, that just understanding that, to your guys' point, it's not just about us, that we're a part of something much bigger than us makes our problems seem smaller because we realize it's not just us in this room. You know, we're not holding up the, the weight of the world. And so Robert did a great job pretty much painting a direct line between loneliness and these psychological and physiological outcomes. So what I've done is taken his work and others and created this entire corpus of the fact that because we're so isolated, grinding it out for things that we don't, you know, intimately necessarily believe leads to our own well-being is leading us to this crisis of all of these negative outcomes. So to answer your question specifically, I think fun is a great tool to mitigate loneliness in this way and improve health outcomes because fun is is the lubricant that makes us want to hang out with the people that we enjoy, right? And so one of the things as you Describe like if you have kind of habituated, you know, your time with uh, friends that you don't necessarily feel bring you joy. Oftentimes you can look broader, like who are the friends that when you spend time with them, make you giggle, make you smile, make you walk away going, I want to do that again. And if you haven't, you know, quote unquote, created a play date with them for a while, just call them up. You know, most people, especially if you do the organizing, you know, I was about to jump in when you said, you know, creating a dinner date like that. That is an amazing, it, that's Lachoni's advice, right? Like never eat alone. Yeah, yeah. If that's too much for you, like one of the things I suggest, uh, reserve a table at a comedy club, especially if you don't like to talk a lot, right? Like you are going to be with a bunch of cool friends. You're already in an environment where you're not forced into chit chat and you guys will all walk out of there still really enjoying that time. And there's all sorts of those opportunities. Yes. You know, you, you gave a, a hat tip to bowling too. I meant, you know, it just, it, it just takes that, that five seconds of premeditation. Like, oh, wait, it's that simple. I just need to call and reserve a table. And they will come, I promise you. If you're not a total asshole, yeah. they will come. Yeah. I was celebrating my 41st birthday during my wife's sabbatical. And it was so interesting because we were in Europe and I was like, well, what can I do for my birthday? I'm not drinking anymore. And I got way into F1 over the last couple of years. So I reached out to some friends and I said, hey, I'm going to be in Paris. You want to go go-karting? I found this karting course. And my European friends flew out, joined me for the weekend. And the highlight of the entire weekend, we went out to dinner, we saw some comedy, we saw some shows. The highlight of everyone's weekend was the go-karting. We were comparing each other's scores. We were laughing about the turns and the speeds. And we were by far the oldest ones there, <laughs> celebrating my 41st birthday against a bunch of 15 and 16-year-old French kids who are whipping around the track. But there are so many ways that if you are the instigator of fun, you bring fun back to those relationships of friends you hadn't connected with or seen in months or years even, you'd be surprised how many of them join in and are excited to have this opportunity for fun in their own lives because they're over-indexing on work and all of that stress that's going on. And we always say in our X Factor Accelerator, the first ingredient in any relationship building is fun. Whether it's business networking, whether you're out socializing, or whether you're just sitting there at work. If you can bring fun to the table, people will want to be around you. People are chasing fun in their lives. As we talked about, there's just a dearth of fun right now around us here stateside. And I was making friends in Colorado on the chairlift and seeing them at the chalet afterwards, like in those shared experiences of moments together and bringing fun to the equation, it opens up those opportunities to build new relationships in your life. If you aren't happy with existing relationships of convenience, as you call them, <laughs> the same boring thing week in and week out. Well, and I think to back you up, you know, again, as a macro sort of hypothesis that comes out through the book is that it's clear in a general sense, fun is invigorating, right? And when fun is absent, you tend to be depleted. So even if you're doing something that's meaningful, 
you know, I talk about this in chapter 11 with regards to change makers. Like if everything is through martyrdom, right? Or, or you're just creating an environment that doesn't attract people. Again, going back to the psychological concept called valence, like ultimately people aren't wanna, gonna wanna do it anymore. That's just the simple truth. But you create a fun environment, even if you guys are doing hard stuff, it's invigorating. You want to go back. What I'd love to to give as an exercise to our listeners as we wrap here is just the the play model so that they can look at their life currently and bring some more fun into it. Yeah. So the play model is a model in the book. It's, it, it's presented early in the book. It stands for pleasing, living, agonizing, and yielding. Pleasing are activities that don't take a ton of energy to do, but we find fun. And so I make a case based on some work from Matthew Killingsworth out of Harvard, why that's important. Uh, The living quadrant are things that are hard to do so that we can't do them all the time, but lead to things like transcendence. And so, you know, I give some examples of how to integrate those into your life. The important is the last two quadrants, which are yielding and agonizing. Yielding are all the things that we've talked about, this habituated behavior that we kind of displaces discomfort, but doesn't lead to our betterment that we kind of, you know, it's just essentially wasting our time. And then agonizing are the hard things. And actually this has been one of the most fun podcasts, I think, to talk about because it sounds like you coach your folks how to really, you know, minimize those. And I think a lot of folks take for granted that, you know, yes, we're not saying that life is meant to be, you know, uh, all whimsy. We all need to do hard things, but they're generally ways to make the hard things, you know, to survive the slings and arrows uh, more pleasurable. And so looking at your agonizing activities and finding opportunities to change them up becomes important and really creating that space, you know, using that model first, because you don't want fun to just be another thing on your to-do list, right? Then then essentially you are going to get a lot of resistance because we're all busy. So we don't want to add another thing on, especially something that at the onset doesn't sound that interesting. So the the play model is a great way to create that space so that you can then integrate fun things back into your life. Yeah, so take a moment, take a blank sheet of paper, pause this, create the quadrants as Mike just laid out, and start going through some activities that you do every day that you'd like to do more of that maybe are yielding that you could pass off to someone else. You know, I, I hate numbers, so we have a bookkeeper for that. <laughs> I find doing our bookkeeping, especially as we're approaching tax season here, to be very yielding <laughs> for me. So there are ways that you can outsource those things that create the time, as we talked about, the time affluence that we need to then double down on the fun that leads to reinvigorating our existing relationships and creating new relationships in our life. Thanks for joining us, Mike. This was so much fun. Where can our audience find out more about you and the work that you do? Yeah, thanks so much. So the book, The Fun Habit, is out now anywhere you enjoy buying books. And I talk about the science of fun on my website, michaelrucker.com. And we love asking every guest what their X factor is. What do you think makes you unique and extraordinary, Mike? I think my, so I created this project in 2007 um, when, again, I was kind of like, hey, you know, life kind of seems to be passing me by. And so I made a commitment every three months to reach out to two people wiser than me to make some sort of social impact and to do something amazing. So my last amazing thing is I just got back from Sao Paulo F1. And I didn't really think it was that remarkable when I did it. But now that I'm 16 years in and haven't, you know, missed a beat, people are like, what? You committed to something and I've been doing it 16 years. So I think, you know, the fact that I've had this follow through, I set the bar low. So even though, you know, the first year was probably like, oh, that's not that remarkable. You know, now the fact that I can look back and I have, you know, over 50 amazing experiences I've connected with over a hundred, you know, just really smart people and learn from them. And again, really feel good about the impact I've made in the world. I I guess that's my X factor. I love that. That's so beautiful. Thank you again, Mike. This is a fun conversation. Definitely. Thanks so much for having me. 